This is a special edition of Of Note, a podcast on innovation. We are having timely conversations with some of the innovators from season one about the coronavirus pandemic and how it's affecting their personal, professional, and business lives. Today, we are talking with John Michael Carter. Mr. Carter is the CEO of Chartspan Medical Technologies, the largest managed service provider of chronic care management programs in the United States. Chartspan has grown from a team of two to more than 200 people. Now among the largest employers in downtown Greenville, South Carolina, John Michael has quite a bit to say about growing a company, especially when the company has been named one of the top 10 most innovative companies in America. When last we spoke, John Michael discussed co-founding the company with his brother. First of all, it's awesome to be able to work with your best friend and your brother every day. But I'm also thankful that that happened for me later in life. I think as 20 year olds, we were dumb. We didn't know what we didn't know, right? I don't know that we would have been this effective. He's also talked about how Chartspan has developed a culture of celebrating failure. I define innovation as the willingness and ability to fail. Because when you're willing to fail, not just give it lip service, but promote it, celebrate it, acknowledge it, then you empower your employees to go out there and keep innovating. The truth is, we only hear the, the positive stories, but the path to innovation is littered with negative stories of constant failure. How to properly handle the capital and commitments that are required of growing a company. Try sitting in front of a board or investors that have given you $25 million and tell them you're going to fail a bunch of times. No, it's not an easy conversation. In fact, it's awkward. At times. He also shared best practices and resources for enhancing productivity, leadership, and entrepreneurship. If you haven't seen the videos or listened to the podcast session, check it out online at scribblesc.com. That's scribblesc.com. John Michael, I appreciate you taking the time to chat again and for being a great supporter of this program. My pleasure. I'm delighted to be here. So there's so much to catch up on, but uh, you know what? Let's just start here, man. Tell me how about how life has changed for you. So Chartspan provides chronic care management solutions to Medicare practices, specifically to their patients between their appointments. That means I run a really large call center for full of clinicians and nurses who are engaging patients every hour of every day about their medical condition, questions that they have. Uh, Often it's about getting prescriptions filled or appointments made or ensuring that the patients are following the care goals of their provider. So for me, it's been an extraordinary challenge in the midst of COVID-19 being an actual healthcare provider of services Mm -hmm. because I could not endure even a moment of disruption in my business because my patients and my doctors are counting on me. Yet my number one priority is protecting my employees and my employees are trying to protect their families. So it was a delicate wire walking act to to be able to pull off what we did last week. What we had to do was we, one, we were anticipating the governor's order that we would need to stay in place. He hinted on Friday that's coming, but it hasn't come yet. But we knew we needed to get out in front of that. So what we did was take more than 200 employees with about 36 hours of, of planning and preparation time, and we sent them home in shifts of 15. Wow. They would come to work in about a half hour orientation. We had all their computer hardware and peripherals ready to go, boxed it up. Within an hour, they had to be home connected and serving patients. On the back of a napkin, we kind of anticipated the consequences of what were going to happen. We were going to have missed calls. We were going to have utilization problems. We were probably going to endure quality problems. What I greatly underestimated was the resolve and resiliency of my employees. Not only did we not incur any of those problems, our utilization, our patient satisfaction scores, our productivity all increased in a month in which I told the board we were gonna miss all of our performance numbers 
we're going to exceed them. Wow. And within three and a half days, we moved our entire operation for every single employee remotely. And we haven't skipped a beat. So, and so j- this is, that's extraordinary, uh, John Michael. Just so, so I, I bring everybody up to speed on this, uh, you and Chartspan in, in many ways are at the forefront of pushing telemedicine, but at the same time, you operated from a centralized office, correct? In Greenville? Our headquarters are located in Greenville and 100% of our employees other than a few employees that we have remote, but they're sales folks or technology folks. They're not clinicians delivering services. 100% of those employees, until a few days ago, worked from our corporate headquarters in downtown Greenville. And so what my technology team has done that's allowed me to be able to run the business this way is that they have centralized in real time all of my analytical data, all of our systems, So that when you have one of our secure encrypted pieces of hardware, computer essentially, Mm -hmm. it's loaded with the things you need to do to do your job. And through all of the infrastructure planning and the deployment of of web-based HIPAA certified encrypted uh, services, we've been able to do this and and do it at a pace that I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around. How are you? You know, I remember the, our conversations from the past vividly. I, I think you've had some great advice, um, certainly very articulate with the advice and best practices that you have talked about. Um, you know, I know you are a, a man who really believes in the, the power of culture uh, for a team. Uh, and, and how that, if, if, if healthy and, and managed well, can, can really be the difference in how you compete as an organization. So how are you managing your team during this new setup, this virtual setup? You know, I think as leaders, anytime there's a crisis, the one thing I think we're prone to do is to stand before our employees and assert a sense of confidence. But honestly, I think you have to discard that baloney when you're not confident. I think one of the things that you have to do in a moment of crisis, sure, you want to you, you want to you want to display confidence, but you also have to display vulnerability. You have to you have to tell them, I don't know, I'm figuring this out as we go. I do not have a playbook. This has never happened before. I think things like that are important, and your employees need to hear. And when you're certain, the confidence will come through. And when you're not certain, I think too often we're afraid to tell them, I don't know yet. I don't have an answer for you. I don't like our strategy right now. I'm trying to figure out how to, how to come up with a better one. Those are things that I say. And I think there are things that, those are things rather that my employees appreciate. Because the first time you're overconfident or the first time that you say something that's not believable or worse that you can't deliver on, it's going to backfire and your employees will lose confidence. I have found that the, the, the best tool of communication in moments like this is to be vulnerable and just be as brutally honest as you can. You know, I know this is a, this probably is an unfair question, but, but, but I mean, you're seeing with your KPIs, you know, equal to or potentially slightly better outcomes. Um, you're seeing a lot of resiliency there. That's obviously a testament to the culture you have built. Uh, do you see coming out of this um, a sense that you might have a new path for growth or this might be something that you would consider in the future from a investment standpoint? Uh, In other words, you know, hey, we can do a multiple location. uh, And I know you have different groups everywhere, but essentially like you can decentralize a little bit. You can have, uh, you know, potentially a part of your operation be remote. Is that something that you're seeing through this or, 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 should this pandemic be finished tomorrow? Would you return to as you were prior to this? What I'm learning now is that I can successfully operationalize a remote clinical workforce. I used to think I couldn't do that, but you know, necessity is the mother of, of all invention. They say, well, We've kind of figured it out very quickly here in the next over the last few days. And in the coming weeks and months, 
I think that I think this a portion of this at least will become permanent. Here's what I'm faced with from a talent development standpoint. There are so many nurses in South Carolina or around the country who want to work an extra shift, maybe an extra 10 to 20 hours a week, but maybe he or she has children or family. They don't necessarily want to go to another job. If I could hire nurses or clinicians who want to work 10 or 20 hours a week and they live in Charleston or San Diego, Mm -hmm. and the only way that I could get them is that type of part-time work, boy, I'll I'll take them in a minute. I'll train them to do what we do. They can keep their full-time job, but maybe this is a way to pick up some extra work, some extra money, and do really good work, the type of noble, important healthcare work we do every day. And from from an HR perspective, our eyes are wide open right now thinking, you know, the world is our oyster. We're we're not just happy to have someone who lives in Greenville, South Carolina, be a clinical employee. Now we can stretch across the United States and raise the bar. I mean, I, I love Greenville and we have some amazing employees, but if I can draw talent from more than just Greenville, the entire country, then that means the quality of my clinician is going to stay top notch. You know, it sort of begs to be asked this, given that you you manage chronic care, your clinicians, your company, it's essentially on the front lines of this as well. Are you all coming across people who are battling uh, the coronavirus? We are. Our inbound calls have, our enrollments rather, have increased 30%. Our inbound calls, I think, have increased uh, somewhere between 20 and 30%. I was just looking over the latest set of data. More than 60% of our phone calls involve the COVID-19 virus. Wow. And when I say that, it doesn't mean that the patient has it. Mm -hmm. In fact, less than 1% of our patients um, are, are, are dealing with COVID-19 uh, as a virus. It, it's just not that pervasive as, as everybody understands. But almost everybody who's over the age of 65 and in Medicare is hyper-concerned about it, and they should be. They're the most vulnerable at-risk patients. What we spend the majority of our time talking about is their fear. And our healthcare clinicians almost take on a behavioral management role trying to assure patients that no, it's allergies, it's not the coronavirus. Right. So we're spending a ton of time. I, I know this week we launched a new initiative where scammers are calling Medicare patients trying to get their Medicare ID so that they can send them a fake COVID-19 home test. Ugh. First of all, FDA hasn't approved the COVID-19 test at home, so it's a scam. And so you know, we're, it's not just healthcare, but we're, we're teaching them don't, you know, don't ever give your Medicare ID information to somebody over the phone that these tests are scams. There's just a lot of different areas within the coronavirus that we're helping and assisting patients with every day. Are there any other major problems that, that you guys are helping to solve right now with COVID-19? Um, any innovative steps that you're taking to ensure a sustainable solution to that over time? The number one benefit right now for our 106 healthcare systems and practices around the country that we serve, the number one benefit that we're delivering for them right now is keeping their patient waiting rooms unclogged. So remember when I said less than 1% of our patients actually have the coronavirus or any serious symptoms that might be the coronavirus. What we're doing is following COVID-19 clinical protocols and screening those patients so that they don't end up in our ER or they don't end up in the hospital or they don't end up at the doctor's office amidst other patients, right? And, Mm -hmm. And keeping them safe and healthy. And so one of the challenges you have for for healthcare practices today is they don't want you walking in if you've got COVID-19. What, what they want to do is to be able to screen you. And frankly, a lot of these practices are under extreme pressure right now. They're in sick mode, not wellness mode, and they're operating out of a triage um, perspective. Sure. And so we become the first line of defense for these practices to screen the patients manage the fears of these patients so that the doctors can deal with the really sick patients and we can take care of those who are not. Is the COVID-19 pandemic in some ways um, helping to trial out for you where telemedicine can go 
in the future? Because it sounds to me like you're sort of seeing in this uh, in this uh, scenario here an opportunity of where it may not be treating it, directly treating COVID nineteen, but it is allowing what infrastructure we have to do what they can do. To your point, from a triage standpoint, by uh, and there are there you're, you're allowing them to do that because they can offload to you. Uh, uh, all of these other functions that they would normally have to deal with. And in that way, our role, the chronic care management program and the role that we play will be elevated in the days and years to come because many doctors will see how valuable their chronic care management program was during a critical moment like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, On another note, it's interesting. I had a phone call Friday night with the CEO of, of, Actually, he's the president of the largest telehealth company in the country. And I'm just curious. I wanted to know how he was doing. I had a a, a real interest in how he was selling and closing deals right now because you can't get on airplanes. You can't go see, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, practices and and sell your services or wares or whatever it might be. And he he laughed and said, I am am selling ice in the desert. He said, I can't find enough people to answer the phone for the inbound calls that are coming in. If I could start any business right now, it would be telehealth software. But, but it, what, what it, what it really means now is we have remarkable adoption by providers that wasn't there before COVID-19 mm-hmm. around virtual telehealth. And so what's happening is that many doctors in the last two to three weeks have had to figure out, I've got to practice medicine in a different way. I can't do it in a traditional bricks and mortar capacity. I now have to use telehealth and video calls to meet with my patients virtually. By the way, patients want this as well. Patients are happy to do it. It means they don't have to get in a car and go to right. you know, a place where sick people hang out and wait for you know 20 minutes in the waiting room to see their doctor for seven minutes. It's more efficient. I think it's just as effective, perhaps in some cases more. And I think one of the lasting things that will come of COVID-19 was the, the, the adoption of telehealth services, both between the provider and patient for virtual visits, but also for companies like mine that provide telehealth services to chronically ill patients in front of the providers, dealing with a lot of the, the healthcare issues that confound so many folks who have chronic conditions and who are vulnerable at times like this. If you were, and this is an apolitical question, it's really more about leadership. If, if, if you were, you know, if you were a mayor, uh, in charge of a municipality, or if you were the president of the United States or any other country, what, what would you, would you be doing something differently than what leadership we've seen now through this crisis? Is there something you would recommend that someone in that leadership position do? I have empathy for, for our leaders because. They didn't, they, they were never, you know, we've never been exposed to something like this and there is no playbook on what you're supposed to do. That said, I'm not sure, and this may be controversial, I'm not sure we're handling this in the best way. I've, I've listened to a lot of experts and it seems to me, and this again will sound radical, but taking more of a martial law approach and absolutely forcing people to stay in their home for 14 days until the symptoms have come or gone, and then putting everyone back into the workforce. Once you know that it it can't spread because you've locked everything down, including us in our homes, and then from a lasting standpoint, maybe pay attention to those that are 70 and above. But if you allow people to continue to go outside to mingle, the only guarantee you have is the virus is going to continue to spread. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think we took this seriously from the onset. And I think we've been way too lax in in how we've been managing folks and and essentially, um, you know, letting the virus spread in the way that it has. So I, I think we're going to learn a lot of lessons when this is over. And I think one of the lessons that that we have to take away is you must act faster and it may not be popular, but I I think you've got to be way more earnest in locking down folks so that the virus doesn't spread and it runs itself out. 
Yes, thank you so much, John Michael, for for all of this advice and 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 for your thoughts on this. Again, as someone who uh, who's on the front lines and whose company is helping with the the healthcare crisis right now because of coronavirus as well as other things, I think your perspective on all of this is is very timely and relevant. Um, is there anything else that you would you want to say or, or or leave for for any listener that we have, or um, you know, any any last bit of advice? Just be safe and keep innovating and uh, enjoy listening to your program. Share those ideas with Scribble in your program, and, and we appreciate you pushing it back out for everybody to edify. I'm delighted to be here, and, and thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much, John Michael. You guys have a great day. Stay safe as well. Take care. Thank you for tuning into our special edition of Of Note, a podcast on innovation. These are challenging times for everyone and in ways expected and unexpected. You might be facing the virus head on or supporting a loved one who is fighting for their lives. You might be a business owner worried about how to take care of your employees or an entrepreneur losing momentum on a vision you've devoted your life to building. You might be a leader wrestling with a lack of information and deciding between the lesser of two evils. You might be someone who has a great way of solving problems and making a difference. Or you might just be tired and lonely from the social isolation. Whatever your case may be, remember you are not alone and that we all carry each other. One of my favorite quotes of all time is this. You may see me struggle, but you will never see me quit. Now more than ever, the world needs you to show up today. You are powerful. You are valuable. And what you believe changes the world. It needs that special thing you've been dreaming about since you were little. It needs your spark to light up the darkness. So stay positive, my friends. Take care of your health, stay home, wash your hands, love your family, and keep dreaming big.